Hello beautiful friends and bookish fam. My name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. Today we are here to do the next video in my bookshelf series where I take you through my book collection one bookshelf at a time. Last year I started a series where I planned on taking you through my book collection one shelf at a time rather than doing just a standard bookshelf tour although I might end up going ahead and doing one of those anyway in the future. But basically the idea of this was to give you a more solid idea of the books that I kept on my shelves and why I kept them because for the most part anything that I keep on my shelves are books that I really love and I want to keep on my shelves. And so really quickly since it's been a while I haven't done one of these videos I don't believe since Bookmas so it's been almost five months now just to kind of recap. As you can mostly see behind me I have five shelves. Three of them are full bookcases and two of them are half cases. One of the half cases houses all of my unread physical TBR and that was the last video that I showed you. The second half case houses all of my paperbacks because I definitely have way more hardbacks than paperbacks. The shelf that's over here that you can't really see, this is all of my book of the month and contemporary fiction type novels. Then I have a science fiction fantasy bookcase and then over there, that very last one, that is my mystery thrillers and then down there is my smaller collection of historical slash literary fiction and classic classics. And then so far we've gone through the first three shelves of my contemporary bookcase which is primarily all book of the month and we've gone through my physical TBR. And I wanted to kind of veer off path before heading back to my contemporary bookshelf and I wanted to go through my science fiction and fantasy bookcase. So today we are going to do the first three shelves and then we're going to do the next three shelves. The reason why I don't feel the need to do this bookcase one shelf at a time is because the vast majority of this bookcase are full of series. And so if I'm talking about one book in the series I'm going to be talking about all of the books in the series and then I also have multiple special editions so I would be showing all of those at once and so it doesn't really make a lot of sense to do it shelf by shelf. So instead we're going to do my sci-fi and fantasy bookcase in two parts. Like I said first three shelves and then the second three shelves. For the most part the shelves are not changing. The only thing that I'm adding to the shelves are anything that I've recently hauled and have read. So if you're watching my hauls and my unhauls you will know anything that I'm adding or getting rid of. So you can kind of get an idea of how my shelves will change. But like I said after all of these bookshelf series are done I do plan on possibly doing a formal bookshelf tour. I just know that those are not everybody's preferences. A lot of people find them quite boring. They're very hard to film. They are very tedious to film and edit. And so I kind of like the idea of doing this more chit chatty video kind of thing. So without further ado, let's go ahead and start with the first three shelves of my fantasy sci-fi bookcase. All right. So the first handful of books that I'm going to talk to you about are actually special naked hardcover editions of some of the books that I will be talking about later on my shelves. I so far have been keeping them together on my shelves just because naked hardcovers are definitely different in terms of their look and their style because they are definitely more square and they have no dust jacket so they don't necessarily fit in with the rest of my shelves. Obviously this is the Throne of Glass special edition by Sarah J Mass. This is the front. This is the back. They are not signed or anything and I don't believe there's any special content in here so it's really the cover that is the most special thing about it but I have a handful of other similar editions that I'm going to be running through with you really fast. So again Throne of Glass by Sarah J Mass. I also have A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J Mass. So there's the spine. You have this beautiful gold foiling on the cover. You can kind of see Feyre out there hunting in the woods, which is how this story begins, as you all know. And then there is the beautiful wolf on the back. I think that this is just absolutely stunning. It did come with a slip cover that I still have, but I don't necessarily feel the need to keep it on my shelves. Again, it's not signed or anything like that, but there are cute little like chapter headers and things like that in here. So it is definitely stunning. Then I have a couple of collector's editions of Lee Bardugo books. First, I have Shadow and Bone. This is the very first book in her Grisha trilogy. I don't believe that they made the other books in this special edition. But again, it has that beautiful foiling on the cover. It has a sticker that I haven't removed, but basically saying that it's now a Netflix adaptation. Then you have this. You have beautiful sprayed edges and check out those end papers. And again, this is the very first book in her Grisha trilogy. I also have the same collector's editions of Six of Crows, beautiful black cover with red foiling and Crooked Kingdom, which is black and gold. These have just solid red and black sprayed edges. These are are signed and they do have a special author's note in here by Lee Bardugo and I thought it would kind of be fun to read this first paragraph here of the author's note. It says, it says, dear reader, a few years back a character started making noise in my head. At first I thought he would be part of one of my Ravkin folktales, a boy named Dirty Hands who traveled from town to town wrestling with demons and dealing in dark magic that no one else wanted to touch. I also knew that at some point I wanted to write a story from the perspective of a Fjordan witch hunter. Sure, the Fjordans had served as villains in my first novel Shadow and Bone, but I had to wonder what it would look like to grow up with a magical army knocking at your border 
order and how justifiable fear might turn to outright prejudice. I would pair up my witch hunter with a powerful patriotic Grisha on some kind of survival mission and force them both to confront their biases. But would it be a short story? A novella? I didn't know. Besides, I had deadlines to meet. The Dirty Hands, the Witch Hunter, and the Grisha Soldier were all placed high on a dusty shelf to wait for the story that would bring them to life. And that's how you get into Six of Crows and then Crooked Kingdom. I love the duology so much. I love it more than the original Shadow and Bone Grisha trilogy. But overall, they are just wonderful fantasy series that I highly recommend if you haven't already checked them out. And then the last naked hardcover that I have for the time being, the Illumicrate Special Edition of The Cruel Prince by Holly Black. It's got solid green sprayed edges, silver foiling on the cover, and it has these adorable little illustrations in there. I don't remember offhand if they are in the original editions. I'll have to look when I pull them off my shelves. I got the Cruel Prince box when it was released by Illumicrate, but unfortunately I missed out on the other two when they were released separately, so I only have this edition. If you're not familiar with this series, this follows our main character Jude Duarte, and she is basically a human living in the land of the Fae with her sister. She's actually living with the man who killed her parents. This man came into the real world, the human world, slaughtered her parents, and took her and her twin sister into the land of the Fae. That's where she's been living ever since. Naturally, it is hard for a mortal to be in the land of the Fae. She's picked on constantly in this realm, but regardless, she is determined to fit in and she's determined to be part of, I think it's like what the Royal Guard, that's what she wants to do. And so you're kind of following her and her rise in this kingdom. And then of course, it's also about Cardin, the cruel prince and his shenanigans. And there's actually quite a lot of politicking going on in here, which was quite fascinating as you're seeing Jude and Cardin both rise to power and some of the stuff that happens in the series, which is phenomenal. So glad to have this beautiful special edition on my shelves. Then of course, I also have the standard editions of Six of Crows as well as Cricket Kingdom by Lee Bardugo. Not really going to say anything more about these since we just discussed them a moment ago, but of course I do have the standard editions. Next, I have two copies of Ninth House by Lee Bardugo. This is a special edition, but I don't remember where I got it from. This might be the Barnes & Noble special edition. I'm not sure, but I also have the Waterstones edition of Ninth House as well. This includes some exclusive content, which I haven't actually read. I just recently read this in January and I really, really loved this. So this is Lee Bardugo's first attempt at an adult novel. It follows our main character, Alex Stern, who is at Yale, and she's basically been a hired as part of an organization that kind of oversees Yale's secret societies, particularly eight of the ones that deal with like arcane occult magic. And Alex has been hired for a specific reason because she can actually see ghosts and ghosts have the ability to kind of interfere with the rituals that some of these houses perform. And when that happens, things can go really wonky and become really dangerous. And so she's been hired as part of this organization to kind of oversee them. And in this story, her mentor, the one that she's planning on taking over for Darlington goes missing. And so this book is trying to find out what happened to Darlington, but there's also something bigger going on here. There are some murders that are happening that Alex is trying to solve as well. This is basically a dark academia story with magic, and I really love the vibes and the atmosphere of this a whole lot. I'm excited to get into Hellbent, which is the second book. I believe it's going to be a trilogy, so I don't believe Hellbent is the final book in the series, but I really, really enjoyed this story, and I'm excited to continue. I thought Lee Bardugo did an excellent job diving into the adult dark academia realm, especially a realm that is becoming kind of more and more saturated as time goes on. This just really stood out to me. I had a great time with it and I'm looking forward to continuing. Then ending the first shelf and going into the second shelf, I have more editions of the Cruel Prince series by Holly Black. I have the standard edition and the Barnes & Noble exclusive edition. Similarly, I have the standard edition and Barnes & Noble edition of The Wicked King, which is the second book in that series. And then again, the standard and Barnes & Noble editions of The Queen of Nothing, which is the third and final book in that trilogy. Next, I have the Fairy Loot edition of The Atlas Six by by Olive e. Blake. I also have the beautiful Illumicrate edition. They are so different. I mean, look at this. This is definitely more subdued and classy. It's got beautiful, beautiful gold foiling. Look at that spine and then those sprayed edges. I absolutely love it. Here are the end pages. And then this of course has a more galaxy type theme type vibe. You got silver foiling, you got the blues and the purples. Again, stunning galaxy-ish sprayed edges. It has its own end pages as well. These are both just absolutely beautiful. So I have to admit that I'm not fully in love with the Atlas Six by Olive e. Blake. This again is supposed to be a dark academia novel, but I didn't really get too much dark academia out of this. In fact, what I felt I got was like a very pretentious, very sciencey over my head type of story that I didn't really vibe with or connect with. I will say that I listened to this via audio and I think that was my first mistake. I think I needed to read this physically because a lot of it, a lot of it went over my head. You can tell that Olive e. Blake is a very studious, scholarly, intelligent person that comes through very well in here, but also it's very extremely pretentious. And it doesn't really bode well for the story overall. I felt like I was disconnected when she would go into these overly theoretical sciencey things about time and time loops and things of that nature. Let me read what this is about to give you an idea. Welcome to the Alexandrian Society. When the world's best magicians are offered an extraordinary opportunity, saying yes is easy. Each could join the secretive Alexandrian Society, who
whose custodians guard lost knowledge from ancient civilizations. Their members enjoy a lifetime of power and prestige, yet each decade only six practitioners are invited to fill five places. So basically at the beginning of this they know that one of them is not going to make it, right? Following recruitment by the mysterious Atlas Blakely, they travel to the society's London headquarters. Here each must study and innovate within esoteric subject areas, and if they can prove themselves over the course of a year, they'll survive, most of them. So on the outset, this sounds absolutely fantastic, but the execution was very wanting for me. Again, I do think I made a mistake by listening to this via audio. I do plan on reading The Atlas Paradox physically while also listening to it. So we're going to see how this goes. I hope that it improves. I know a lot of people really, really enjoyed this story, but there was just something about it. So I'm really, really hoping that I love The Atlas Paradox more than I liked The Atlas Six. Then I have the first three books in the Diviner series, starting with, of course, The Diviners by Libba Bray, Lair of Dreams, which is book two, and Before the Devil Breaks You, which is book three. I just recently read and finished King of Crows, the fourth and final book in this series, and I have it on the way. It is coming to me. If you're not familiar, this is a book that is set in 1920s New York, and it follows a group of teens who have special abilities. Nobody really knows why or how they have these special abilities, and in the first book, you're basically kind of meeting all of them. You're learning what they can do, the dynamics between them, and then they all start to come together and really figure out who they are, why they are the way they are, and a lot of answers and secrets are revealed in books two, three, and four. They also have to band together to kind of defy this malevolent spirit who lives in a like parallel realm and he's trying to break into their world, take care of all the diviners, and kind of take over. So that's what the series is. It's definitely paranormal. There are some really spooky, creepy vibes to this. I really enjoyed books two and three. Four was also pretty decent. I didn't mind the conclusion to the series. Book one was actually the weakest, which is, I know, an unpopular opinion. I know everybody loved book one, but this re series really took off for me with books two and three. Yes, all of the covers are different because it seemed like each new publication, they changed the covers. So one of these days, maybe I'll have a matching set, but ultimately it really doesn't bother me. The King of Crows will match this edition. So I'll have two in this edition and I missed out on the beautiful special editions that recently came out, I think from like Fairy Loot. So sad for me, but ultimately just glad to be done. Glad to have these on my shelves. Then I have the beautiful illustrated edition of Assassin's Apprentice by Robin Hobb. I'm finally jumping on the bandwagon of Robin Hobb. I'd always been very trepidatious of starting because she is what I would consider a classic fantasy author. And I'm just not as interested in classic fantasy as I am with the newer releases. But Robin Hobb gets so much praise. She is so hyped. This is a very beloved series and I wanted to give it a shot. And so what better way than with a stunning illustrated edition. Let me see if I can find a picture for you. Here's a picture. There's not too terribly many, but it was still enjoyable to read this and then listen. I was doing both at the same time. So this follows our main character, Fitz Chivalry Farseer. And when this book starts, he's only five or six years old. He is basically dropped off at the keep of the Royal Palace by his maternal grandparent. And they basically said, you know what? We don't want this boy anymore. This is the bastard son of the king in waiting and y'all need to do something with him. And when the king in waiting, who is Prince Chivalry, basically the son of the king, finds out, he kind of abdicates, renounces his title and his position, and he basically flees, kind of leaving Fitz on his own. So Fitz at this point is very much an unwanted child. He is basically taken under the wing of Boric, who is, I think he's the stable master. I think that might be the proper term, but basically Boric kind of watches out for him. And then eventually the king, so Fitz's grandfather, takes an interest in him and he wants to kind of secure Fitz's alliance to the realm. And he decides to train Fitz as an assassin. So you're kind of following that journey in here. I believe this follows Fitz until he is in his mid-teens. So I think he's only like 15 or 16, but the rest of the trilogy and then other trilogies that will feature him follow him into older age. So I'm definitely very new to the series. I'm just getting started with it. I had an overall decent reading experience with this. I'm not necessarily fully invested or intrigued by the series, but I will absolutely be continuing. I buddy read this with Sarah from Sarah's Nightstand and I will be buddy reading the rest of the trilogy with her as well. And I'm looking forward to continuing with Royal Assassin. So glad to have this one on my shelves as well. Then I have the Curse Breaker trilogy by Bridget Kemmerer, starting with A Curse So Dark and Lonely, A Heart So Fierce and Broken, and A Vow So Bold and Deadly. So the very first book in this series, A Curse So Dark and Lonely, is basically a Beauty and the Beast retelling. It follows our main character, Ren. He's Prince of Emberfall, and he has been cursed by a sorceress. He has to relive the autumn of his 18th year over and over and over again until he finds a woman to fall in love with him. And at the end, if he doesn't find a woman to fall in love with him, he turns into this hideous beast who's basically going to ravage the country and all of the people in it. And by the start of the story, essentially, it is just him and Grey who is the captain of his guard and who also becomes his friend. And Grey has basically been tasked to go and find the women for Ren to potentially fall in love with. In this story, he ends up going to Washington DC in the real world and bringing back Harper into Emberfell. And it goes from there as Harper tries to help the situation, tries to save the town, tries to break Ren of his curse. And then the series ultimately goes from there. It was a phenomenal reading experience. I highly recommend, especially if you do like the A Court of Thorns and Roses series by Sarah J Maas. I think you will love this one as well. Then I also have Defy the Night by Bridget Kemmerer. This is the first in the start of a new fantasy series. And I recently read this last year as well. And I really, really enjoyed this and I'm excited to continue. I'm just gonna read what it's about because 
because I kind of find myself having trouble explaining it. The Kingdom of Kandala is on the brink of disaster. Rifts between sectors have only worsened since a sickness began ravaging the land and the only known cure, an elixir made from the moonflower petal, is severely limited. The king holds on to a tenuous piece with a ruthless hand. Out in the wild, apothecary apprentice Tessa Kate and her best friend Wes are tired of watching people suffer. They risk their lives every night to steal moonflower petals and distribute the elixir to those in need, but it's still not enough. As rumors spread that the cure no longer works and sparks of rebellion begin to flare, a particularly cruel act from the king's justice makes Tessa desperate enough to try the impossible, sneaking into the palace, but what she finds on the inside makes her wonder if it's even possible to fix Kandala without destroying it first. I really enjoyed the overall premise in here. A lot of things are not as they seem, and Tessa is definitely uncovering that for herself as you go throughout the story. I love Bridget Kemmerer. She is such a solid author. I've loved every book that I've read by her, even her YA contemporaries. They're very, very solid, and she has definitely proven herself as a solid, like, YA fantasy author as well. So again, highly recommend her. Now we are getting to the end of the second shelf, and we are entering into my J. Kristoff collection, as it were. Y'all know that he is one of my favorite authors of all time. I think he's just a genius. He is a mad genius, but his stories are brilliant. I don't even know how this man comes up with them. His writing is phenomenal. His humor is outstanding. So the first one that I have, and I've actually talked about it recently, The Illuminae Files. This is a YA sci-fi series that is told entirely in mixed media. So you have texts, memos, things like that. It was just one of the most amazing reading experiences I've ever had. All three of the stories are basically epic space operas of a sort. There is so much going on. There's a rogue AI that is trying to kill everybody. Sometimes there is like a zombie outbreak. They're being chased by a corporation that wants to take them down. There is a lot happening in these stories and they are chunky, but they go by so fast because they are mixed media and they are just so fun and engaging and a good time. So of course, this is book one. Gemina is book two and this was definitely my favorite. I loved this one so much. I love the main characters in here. And then you have Obsidio, which is the third and final book in this series. And then of course I have Empire of the Vampire. Look how chunky this boy is. This took me quite a while to get through, but it was definitely well worth the read. This is very much an adult vampire story. It follows our main character, Gabriel. It says, for nearly three decades, vampires have waged war against humanity, building their internal empire even as they tear down our own. Now only a few tiny sparks of light endure in a sea of darkness. Gabriel de Leon, half man, half monster, and last remaining silver saint, a sworn brother of the Holy Silver Order dedicated to defending the realm from the creatures of the night is all that stands between the world at its end. Now imprisoned by the very monsters he vowed to destroy, the last silver saint is forced to tell his story, a story of legendary battles and forbidden love, of faith lost and friendships won, of the wars of the blood and the forever king and the quest for humanity's last remaining hope, the Holy Grail. This of course was very, very epic, very, very long, sometimes repetitive and redundant, but overall a very engaging read. This is probably one I would recommend on audio as well. The audiobook narrator did a really great job. I am very much looking forward to the sequel. If you like vampire stories, this is definitely a different take on a vampire story. And I would definitely recommend if you're looking for a darker vampire story, this one for sure. All right, and now we are getting into the third and final shelf that we're talking about today. You can kind of see it behind me as I had to remove some of the books that I'm going to show you. But basically it's my Nevernight collection, starting with this beautiful Lit Joy collection. It is absolutely stunning. It's really hard to show you like the covers and things like that because they're etched into the covers and, and really doesn't come up well on camera. But if you go to Lit Joy's website, you're going to be able to see these in amazing detail. They also have sprayed edges, never flinch, never fear, never forget, which you know is the motto of our main girl, Mia. What really got me about it though, is that these are annotated. I just could not pass up the annotations in this story. So if I ever do decide to revisit the story, I plan on doing it with these copies so that I could read his annotations. Because like I said, I love his humor and I want to know more about how the mind of this madman works. So I'm super glad to have this, even though they were exorbitantly expensive, crazy, crazy expensive. I cherish these ones immensely. And then I have the regular Ant Illumicrate editions of all three books in the trilogy. This is the standard edition of Nevernight. If you are not familiar, Nevernight is an adult fantasy novel that features our main character, Mia Corberry. When she was just 10 years old, she watched her father be hung for treason. Her baby brother and mother were viciously taken away and she was sent off to be killed. Even though she was sent to be killed at 10 years old, she managed to escape and she ended up on the door of Mercurio, who was a former acolyte of the Red Church, which is basically a group of assassins. And Mercurio kind of takes her under his wing and trains her up because it's soon gonna be her time at the Red Church. He can see the vengeance in Mia that Mia needs to get and he fans those flames. Basically, he teaches her everything that he knows to help her be successful at the Red Church. So the first book is really about her training to become assassin and a lot of stuff goes down. And then the series kind of continues on from there. Absolutely love this series with my whole heart and soul. It is definitely one of my favorite fantasy series of all time, possibly just my favorite series of all time. I absolutely love Mia Corberry and the cast of characters in here. Mia is also known as a Darken, which means she has the ability to manipulate shadows in some capacity. And she always also has a shadow demon with her at all times. He takes the form of a cat. His name is Mr. Kindly. And of course he's a very sassy black cat. So you get a lot of his personality in here as well. But overall, this was just so clever 
clever and creative. The way that he took this story was phenomenal. I just finished the third and final book a couple of weeks ago and I was bawling in tears by the end of it. I was so emotionally drained and hung over. Such a stunning, stunning series. And anytime special editions are released, I will absolutely grab them. And again, as I mentioned, I have the standard edition and then the Illumicrate edition. So this is Nevernight. It's got the beautiful sprayed edges. It's got our crow on the front because Mia is known as the crow. And they are all signed. They have beautiful end pages as well. Let me see if I could show you here. There you go. How stunning. Oh my gosh, just everything. I knew I had to have these when they re-released, so I definitely grabbed them. This is the standard edition of God's Grave. This is the Illumicrate edition of God's Grave. And we have our Eclipse here on the front cover. Absolutely stunning. I just love all the details. Look at that. You have the crow, you have the sword and the helmet, the gladiator helmet, the masks. It's just so flipping stunning. They're just, just beautiful. I love them. And then here's the end pages on those. Here's the standard edition of Dark Dawn and the Illumicrate edition of Dark Dawn, which you know is gonna have our boy, Mr. Kindly. And look at just all of the details that are in there, the skull and the snake. Oh my gosh. I kind of hate seeing that snake on there because if you know, you know. And then there's our Mr. Kindly. Beautiful editions for a beautiful, beautiful series. And then we are actually nearing the end of this third shelf. We are getting into my Sarah J Mass collection. So I'm just gonna talk about one of her books today and go into the rest in the next video because the majority of those books are on shelf number four. So today we're only going to be talking about the adult series that she currently has, her only adult series. It is Crescent City, the first book being House of Earth and Blood. This again is one of my favorite fantasies of all time. She did a fantastic job jumping into the realm of adult fantasy. If you have read her YA and have really enjoyed it, you will love this as well because it is certainly on another level just in terms of complexity and depth and all of the things that happen in here. It is phenomenal. This follows our main character, Bryce Quinlan. She is half human and half Faye. And at the beginning of the story, she's just kind of living it up. She's kind of a party girl. She has her best friend, Danica, who is the leader of one of the wolf packs in this city. And in the very beginning of the story, Danica and her wolf pack are brutally, brutally murdered. And it kind of leaves Bryce to spiral. She is not doing well. And a couple years later, it seems like the thing that killed Danica and her pack has returned and is killing again. And Bryce is kind of enlisted by the archangel Micah to investigate what is happening because she has a connection to this murder and the crimes and things like that. So this is basically her investigation. And of course, because this is dangerous, she is being essentially babysat by Hunt Athelar, who is a fallen angel, and he is essentially Micah's bitch. He is also Micah's personal assassin. You find out a lot more about Hunt, why he's a fallen angel, what that means, what he did. He basically rebelled against the current government. So he rebelled against Micah and the angels and things like that. And now he is a fallen angel and he is basically Micah's slave. And there's a lot more to it. There's a lot more layers, a lot more that's going on that you uncover in this story. And it was just absolutely phenomenal. Loved Bryce, loved Hunt. I think Bryce and Hunt are definitely my new favorite couple in Sarah J Mass's universes. There was a shower scene in this story that was probably the most beautiful and intimate scene that I've ever read. And it had like nothing to do with sex, nothing to do with sex. If you've read this, then you know what I'm talking about. It was just one of those tender heartbreaking scenes that kind of make your chest ache. And she just did a phenomenal job with it. That's all that I can really say about this. She did a fantastic job. And I am so, so excited to be moving on into House of Sky and Breath, which I hopefully will be doing very, very soon, possibly in June, but reading it again with Sarah from Sarah's Night. Dan. Poor Sarah. I'm forcing her to do all the buddy reads with me. But yes, so this is the start of my Sarah J Mask collection and we will get into the rest when we do shelves four through six. All right, y'all, that is it. That is all that I have for this video. This one definitely went long. That's why I didn't want to do like the whole bookcase in one video. So I hope that you are okay with this format. Please comment down below and let me know how you are enjoying this series or comment down below and leave me a crown or a sword emoji for fantasy. I feel that's pretty representative of like the fantasy genre. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I post two videos a week, sometimes three, if I have my shit together and a third video to film, and I would sure love to see you in one of those next videos. Bye guys.